Welcome into the Talking Tide podcast on the Belly Up Podcast Network. I'm Chase Goodbread, sports columnist with the Tuscaloosa News. I'm joined by Travis, our longtime senior analyst at BamaOnline.com. The Talking Tide podcast Twitter feed is Talking underscore Tide. You can get quick links to all of our podcasts right there twice weekly during the football season. And of course, you can catch us live on YouTube and Facebook as well. And the podcast, of course, on uh, any platform where you prefer to get your podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, you can get Talking Tide. We are just a few hours removed from basically the back end of National Signing Day. Although, Travis, you and I go back far enough to where the end of Signing Day was really the end, right? Uh, when when they when the only one there was was that first Wednesday in February, I guess you occasionally would have a straggler or two uh, who would who would wait. But uh, with this early signing period, and I know that this December period has become the NSD, but there's a little bit more fluidity uh, headed toward that next opportunity than there used to be. Yeah, you didn't recruit guys back in the early 90s when we were doing it uh especially in depth you didn't recruit them for the next time around that's the feeling you get now with schools it's like well we may not get them this time but they could be in the portal in six months or 10 months and so we'll catch them on the uh when we sweep back around so entirely different i mean back in 92 93 when we met no cell phones, no social media, certainly no NIL, no transfer portal. I mean, guys would sign. First of all, it was just February. And January was really when all the official visits really Forrest Davis had the hottest 30 minutes of TV on Saturday. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Forrest and, yeah, the recruiting shows. Oh, man. But now it's it, it, it truly never stops now. Nick Saban mentioned today how all the visits used to be in January. Now there are practically none. Now most of those official visits are happening during the summertime because the cycle just kind of got bumped up about six months. But to the Alabama signing class, Travis, as we know it as of now, ranked second nationally, 25 guys. A couple of them haven't signed yet. One key guy who I think is going to wait until that February period is Ryan Williams the five-star wide receiver from Sarah Land. Uh, Julian Sayan, though, the quarterback, uh, not only signs, but he's actually uh, uh, in uniform in practice with the team right now. He'll be headed to Pasadena along with a couple of other guys. Uh, your thoughts overall on, on what Nick Saban was able to pull together this cycle? Yeah, I think it's a heck of a class once again. I mean, you start at the quarterback position with a five-star and Julian Sayan. As you said, one of those guys that's already on campus taking part in bowl practices. He's also set to play in one of the All-American games coming up in early January. So he's getting a jump start. Uh, I just think the skill in general, you know, with Ryan Williams, assuming like everyone else does, that he will follow through and sign with Alabama, even as a reclassifier, even as a 16-year-old, this might be the best high school wide receiver in the country right now. So you add him, Caleb Odom, at the tight end position, a couple of nice tight ends, three really good receivers. I like the offensive skill. You're able to flip Kevin Riley, the Tuscaloosa County running back, on signing day from Miami to the hometown tide. So I like a lot of that, and I like the defensive backs too. It's another deep and talented defensive back class and one that I think – could have an opportunity to impact things pretty quickly. You know, in full disclosure, I, I don't watch as much high school film, recruiting highlights and, and tapes, et cetera, as I used to, certainly. But I have seen enough of Ryan Williams to know that he looks like a guy with the physical gifts uh, to make a quick impact. And, and wide receiver, Travis, is one of those positions where – that can happen most easily and often does happen. Nick Saban on the other end of the spectrum mentioned today about how the offensive line is still for the most part a developmental position and they all are. uh, But a guy who can run and catch and get open can generally play right away. If you can cover, you usually can play pretty quickly. Uh, If you can catch the football and run routes and get open, you can absolutely 
play quickly. And I, I think that's likely the case for Ryan. And then, you know, also today to pick up uh, Bubba Hampton out of Texas, flip him from the home state Longhorns to Alabama, 5'10", 175, one of those versatile guys, really stands out in all three phases of the game at the high school level, whether you're talking wide receiver, whether you're talking lining them up in the backfield, sort of one of those Swiss Army knife players defensively, good player, can return kicks. So, yeah, I think they just continued to add to that arsenal uh, when you talk about the skill spots. Nick Saban today kind of hinting that offensive line, it might be an area where they're not done yet. We'll see what else is yet to come uh, along that front. And it really, it sounded like it's as much – a portal thing as it is a recruiting thing, Travis. Um, you know, he mentioned the value of experience up front. So uh, wouldn't be surprised to see Alabama add a guy or two, whether it's uh, somebody late for uh, recruiting or a portal guy. I saw the other day that one of the best offensive linemen in the portal, the kid from Texas A&M, decided with, to withdraw his name. Uh, so presumably that's one name off the board, but something to watch here in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I, was, I think that was Baronis, the offensive right. tackle for me. And he had a tough game against Alabama. But, you know, Caden Proctor had a pretty tough game or two uh, during his true freshman season. So things can certainly come at those young offensive linemen quickly. Yeah, a couple of things that could be in play there, as you said, could be transfer portal related. Could be he wants to see how guys like Miles McVeigh a Wilkin Formby, those younger tackles that they brought in to compete with guys like Elijah Pritchett, who you talk about into the portal and then back out. That was Elijah Pritchett. So still some options there, uh, but maybe this offseason and spring practice uh, is considered a little bit of an audition. And then if you don't really like what you see there, then you can look at the, uh, the portal Tyler Steen style, I guess you could say. How about Dre Kirkpatrick Jr., Travis, just 12 years after his dad was playing for Nick Saban, uh, joining this signing class, first Alabama Saban legacy guy. It's going to be going to be fun to see uh, what he brings to the table for sure. He just seems to be a guy who makes plays, uh, is around the football lot, not entirely like his dad. I, he's not a, a kind of a pure – prototype cover corner but a versatile defensive back that you can play at some different spots i would think i think uh red morgan another db that they signed is similar in that regard so uh, the versatility is always a good thing but dre jr even in that alabama mississippi all-star game last weekend was all over the place making plays so yeah it looks to be a nice ad overall travis in this in the NIL climate being what it is, how what it's done to recruiting, really turned recruiting on its head. Um, Nick Saban continues to say that his core message to these players is really about player development. And I get it, you know, for a lot of these guys, probably most of these guys, the best NIL, NIL deal they can get is where they're going to go. But, and, and this is a, a bit of what I wrote for the T News tonight, Guys remember, recruits remember what happens the last weekend in April, Travis, when that NFL draft rolls around. And Alabama is always so much on the forefront of that. Um, SEC, of course, annually puts more draft picks uh, into the NFL than any other league. And Alabama, more years than not, is on top of that. So, you know, I, I think that while NIL does, of course, maintain a huge importance for these guys i think when nil deals might be roughly the same or at least commensurate with each other you got a chance to make x dollars at alabama you got a chance to make the same dollars or roughly the same dollars somewhere else that player development factor i think is uh the the deal maker and the deal breaker for the other schools in a lot of these cases well, and the proof's in the pudding. That's the benefit Alabama has right now is that whether you're looking to win national championships, whether you're looking to potentially position yourself as a high draft pick in three or four years, it's all right there. There's no – you're not selling a dream. 
to these guys if you're Alabama and you're not also sort of in this desperation mode where you got to sign off on uh, you know, kids getting a half million dollars or whatever they get to come to your school fresh out of high school. So it, it's actually a good place for Alabama to be. I think that's the place that you would envy if you're other places because the team dynamic, I'm sure, is what Nick Saban has in mind when he stays away from, you know, those type of deals with incoming players because new guy comes in, you got guys that you've been preaching patience to and, you know, be a good program guy, a developmental guy for two, three, four years, and then walks an 18-year-old kid with a half million to a million dollars or whatever it is. Uh, that's not good. That's not good for your team dynamic. It's not good for your culture. And so I think you're seeing more and more Programs are having to decide, are we going to sell the big picture like Alabama? You can go get paid somewhere else now, or you can come here and perhaps get paid a whole lot more in three or four years. Um, it's it's one of those things I think programs are having to, uh, from a culture perspective, are you going to just sort of sell it out and say, look, we, we need the talent first and foremost. We've got to have the, the type of players to compete. We'll figure out the locker room and all that stuff as we move along. Um, and I think we saw some of that with Texas A&M here the last two or couple of years, and I'm not sure that works so well. Interesting to see the way coaches view differently, whether the way to build is through the portal or through the high school ranks. Saban obviously favors the high school ranks, signs a lot of high school guys. He's only taken one portal guy in. He's never been huge in the portal. Three guys, four or five guys has been his norm. Only one so far, the Overton kid who Alabama had recruited uh, in high school uh, comes in from Texas A&M. We could touch on him as well. But Saban likes to be able to get these guys straight out of high school, get them into the program. And I think Saban likes the return on – Hitting a home run with a high school kid, you got him for three years. Get That's good for continuity. Uh, it's good for a lot of things. Whereas the portal, it's a little bit more hit and miss, a little bit more catch as catch can. Well, not every coach is doing it like saving. A lot of these coaches are, are really on the other end of the spectrum buying in whole hog with uh, portal guys. And I understand why they do it. Um, not so much on the high school recruits. I saw a video of Deion Sanders out at Colorado, Travis, uh, earlier today. Not sure what when he made the comment was, but he was more or less saying, "Look, we're we're, a, we're recruiting through the portal. That's what that's kind of what we do." And you know, he, he's I think he said he was only counting on signing a handful of high school guys. Yeah, again, that's sort of the the choice that that some programs are going to have to make, and it's one where again, programs like Alabama, Georgia they have that luxury of still taking that grassroots approach and not having to reprogram guys too. Like we're, we're just going to take the most talented portal guys we can get. But then when they come in, now you got to reprogram them, not just right. in terms of the way you play on offense or defense, but your culture, you know, your expectations on a day to day basis. Um, you know, you're always going to take that reach every once in a while on just a talented guy. And it's usually a guy that you also have some background with. Eli Ricks a year ago kind of mm -hmm. comes to mind from that sure. perspective. But then as we continue to hear from Nick, when asked about Eli Ricks, you know, he, he, he was he was in injured. That was part of it for sure. Coming into Tuscaloosa, mm -hmm. but just trying to get him to where he could play the way they wanted him to play right uh, in their system. You know, that's, that's something you have to take into account. And that's why I think for Alabama, it's still going to be in the portal. It's going to, it's going to be a lot about fits. Um, and that's where I, I think a guy like, you know, LT Overton makes a lot of sense uh, in how he can fit in uh, to Alabama's defense. And he seems to be, uh, from a mindset perspective, what they would want coming into this situation. Going to be interesting to see what Alabama does with him position-wise and size-wise. Travis, he was 285, 290, I think, in high school and more of a, a, a prospect as an interior guy. 
he gets to a and m he drops a bunch of weight i think he played around 260 and uh you know the plan was let's make him more of an edge guy you think alabama puts that weight back on him or no i think you you go organic with him you you put him on the the nutrition plan and if he goes to 285 290 that's fine i, I wouldn't want to hold a guy like that back in terms mm -hmm. of weight and uh uh, physical maturation. Uh, and I think a lot of these guys too, because they see the edge guys in the NFL and it's sort of the glory position and it's a big money position. Yeah. No doubt about it. They all want to be edges, but if I'm Nick Saban and I'm Alabama, what I'm telling LT Overton is go look at Jonathan Allen's contract. Cause that's kind mm -hmm. of what we see you as. If you get right. to 290, 295, we'll play at base in. And then when we go to our nickel or pass rush stuff, we're going to move you inside. And yeah. there's a lot of money to be made by those guys, too. Those guys make it, too. There's no doubt about it. Very, very valuable, uh, those defensive tackles at the next level. The Talking Tide podcast on the Belly Up Podcast Network, the Twitter feed, Talking underscore Tide. Going to thank a couple of sponsors here really quickly. Going to start by telling you all about – Heat Pizza Bar in downtown Tuscaloosa in Government Square. Go see Frank Fleming and his fantastic staff over at Heat. They got the best pizza in town. They've got the standard uh, house red sauce, pepperoni, Italian sausage, green pepper, sweet onion, and mozzarella. You can't beat that one. They've got great apps as well, some super salads, full bar, and, of course, flat screen TVs about every 10 feet over at Heat. So all the big sports games are on over there. You can't beat it over at Heat Pizza Bar. Government Square in downtown Tuscaloosa, 2256th Street. It is, it's Heat Pizza Bar. And I saw where our guy Frank is going to have that massive Michigan watch party on New Year's night. Oh. So you're going to want to check that out. They're going to have specials. They're going to have prizes that they're giving away. And as Frank uh, said in the release, uh, free high fives uh, if you show up at Heat Pizza Bar for that Rose Bowl watch party on Jan 1. That should be a lot of fun, no doubt about it. I'll tell you another place that's a lot of fun right now, especially Peterbrook Chocolatier of Tuscaloosa, 1530 McFarland Boulevard North in the Indian Hills section of Tuscaloosa. I'm just going to tell you, no Christmas stocking. Uh, no gifting really of any kind this time of year is complete without Peter Brook Chocolatier. Whether it is that milk chocolate covered chocolate popcorn, you're going to have that watch party maybe of your own. You're going to need those chocolate footballs that you can find at Peter Brook Chocolatier. Peter Brook Chocolatier, the champions of chocolate for 16 years in Tuscaloosa now. 1530 McFarland Boulevard North in the Indian Hill section of Tuscaloosa. I got multiple bags of Peterbrook around the house right now. That's crushing, how it is around the holidays. That, I've been crushing that peppermint bark, man. It is it is just that time of year. No it doubt. is hard to beat. All right, the Talking Tide podcast on the Belly Up Podcast Network. Moving on, just a few more minutes to go here, but uh, some notes to kind of circle back on, Travis. Of course, we haven't podcasted here in a couple weeks or so since we wrapped up Alabama's win over the Georgia Bulldogs in the SEC championship game but uh, Nick Saban recently with the bring back on George Hilo who of course had been uh, an intern at Alabama back in the day he had coached Michigan linebackers for a couple of years um, your thoughts on that and, and Nick Saban more or less saying I think it was on Monday Travis that hey we, we needed a guy with all that was going on in recruiting and the staff on the road to kind of be able to put a point on what the scouting report on the Wolverines needed to be. Who better than George Hilo, who knows the staff and uh, who knows, maybe ends up replacing Coleman Hutzler. Could be. I think Nick referred to him as a special assistant right. with that comment. And I think that's like four now that Nick's got. Ken Wisenhunt, the former NFL yeah. head coach, Todd Watson. Um, Joe Pendry, I think, is still qualifying as right. a – a special assistant to the head coach. So now that would be four with George, but absolutely it makes sense. He's familiar with Alabama. He understands how that deal works. And he's obviously familiar with hardball and the Wolverines. It's kind of like the NFL, right? That's part of Saban's DNA, no doubt about it. 
maybe if you're coaching the Dolphins and you got a bye week and the week after that you're playing the Patriots and the Patriots yeah. just cut a wide receiver, you sign that guy, bring him in, debrief him, you know, and then suddenly after the Patriots game, you're releasing that guy. But, you know, it, uh, I don't think that's going to be the case with George Hilo because, as you said, maybe he is just the apparent heir apparent to uh, – to Coleman Hutzler, not just in terms of the outside linebackers, but special teams too. You know, he, he spent after he left Alabama, he spent a lot of a couple of years with Jeremy Pruitt, right? Went to Florida State with Jeremy Pruitt. So, you know, he's a guy who continued under the saving defense even after he left Alabama, certainly. So, you know, that 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 speaks to his shot at getting that assistant coaching job as well. And by the way, Coleman Hutzler was Alabama's special teams coach. George Hilo's done that too. He was Maryland's special teams coach, I think, for a year or so before he got to Michigan. So uh, from an experience standpoint, culture standpoint, definitely would be a fit anyway. Yeah, just to slide him right in there and then see where it goes from there. Jace McClellan, we'll touch on him really quickly before we get out of here. Travis remains questionable for the Rose Bowl against the Wolverines. Foot injury, Nick Saban said he's going to do some dry land running, I think, this week. Uh, it sounds like they're not going to get him on the practice field before Christmas, but he'll go out there to Pasadena, Travis, and and uh, they will see how he looks out there. And, you know, as, as well as Alabama was able to play without him in the SEC championship game, it's big for Alabama, in my opinion, to get this guy back if they can. It, it, you always want seasoned players regardless – of a position. So absolutely. If you could have him in some form or fashion to go along with Roy Dell Williams, I guess one of the benefits of this in the last month or so is that Jam Miller seems to have picked up more and more of the load. So it's not entirely new to him. Uh, I think you're seeing him make advancements, not only on the ball, but off the ball, which is going to be important because Michigan, I don't think will be as afraid to, come after Jalen Milrow a little bit more than maybe some previous opponents have. And so absolutely love to have Jace uh, understand his importance, as you said, again, uh, as a guy who can recognize things, uh, can make adjustments on the fly, uh, and then also has that skill set that, that I think could work nicely against a Michigan defense. No doubt about it. Of course, Alabama taking on Michigan in the CFP semifinal January 1st out in Pasadena. Yours truly will be heading out there the day after Christmas. Speaking of which, I want to wish a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holidays to all of our listeners and viewers here on Talking Tide. Travis, it's uh, December seems to just get busier and busier if you cover college football, Travis, but uh, with night with signing day now in the books, I, I'm I'm gonna try to work as little as I can between now and uh, that uh, that Tuesday flight out to California. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're getting a little long in the tooth, good bread. You got to pace yourself a little bit. And by the way, uh, these trips to Pasadena and '09 and like this one, a little different than that one we took over to uh, to Shreveport there around christmas <laughs> yes, time yes. in 2007 a little different trips these days over the last 15 years or so than what we took oh. in 2007 i took them back to back i got the back to back shreveport mm -hmm. in 06 and 07 but Ooh. um you know what else we're doing this before alabama arizona hoops tonight too so right. we want to stipulate that so if you're wondering hey where's the the yeah. alabama basketball talk well we're what only an hour away from tip off as we record this, but that's it's another another uh, formidable matchup for Alabama. What is essentially a road game in Phoenix? Uh, Kashad Johnson for Arizona, a guy that Alabama saw as a part of the San Diego State team mm -hmm. in the NCAA tournament. Now an Arizona Wildcat, Jaden Bradley now an Arizona Wildcat. So should be an interesting one out in the in the Valley of the Sun. Yeah, I guess that one will probably be in the books by the time most of our listeners download this particular podcast. But going into it, Travis, certainly Alabama scratching his head on the defensive side of the ball still um, dropped. I, th I think they've lost three of their last four games, and they're routinely giving up points uh, in the 80s or, or 90s. Um, they got to figure something out on that end. I, it looks like this team is 
going to be able to score plenty, but boy, they got to get some stops. Yeah, I mean, they're pretty much elite on the offensive end and a hell of a lot of fun to watch. Hey, you enjoy watching them, but if you're an Alabama fan, uh, you need more wins. And whereas you think that the committee come March would reward Alabama for these type of matchups, you got to win one or two of them, you know, at some point, or you're really going to have to make some things up, uh, make up some ground and, in SEC play, but I, I think both these teams tonight go in averaging around 92 points per game. So another game that you could certainly see high 80s, low 90s for the winner. Big one for Alabama. They need a signature win. They need a game that they can really hang their right now. On. It's Oregon. I mean, yeah. Oregon's their win right now. You know, Clemson was yeah. an opportunity. Clemson looks pretty good right now. They but, do, but. You're right. Got to win some of them. They do, no doubt. We'll see how they're able to pull it off. And, of course, Travis and I will be coming back at you with a preview of the Alabama-Michigan game uh, a few days before that goes off. Uh, I'll be doing that podcast, I suppose, from from Pasadena. Looking forward to getting out there. But um, for now, let's go do it. Whiskey What's a that? go-go. Yes. That's you'll be. Whiskey a go-go <laughs> will be good, Brad. <laughs> Bar side. Oof. Yeah. Uh-huh. All right. That'll wrap us <laughs> here on Talk It Tide. Uh, for Travis Ryer of BamaOnline.com, I'm Chase Goodbread of the Tuscaloosa News. We'll talk to you next time right here on Talk It Tide.